Happy Friday, everyone. Happy, happy Friday. I'm Dr. Nico White, your host of Intentional Conversations podcast and the founder and lead principal consultant for NWC. And we are delighted that you are here today as our guest. As we're just giving it a moment or two for individuals to get settled in um, and to join this conversation. We want you to please go to the chat and let us know where you're joining the conversation from. It's always a treat to us to be able to see how we have been able to capture the attention of so many people from all across the U.S. and even beyond. And so let us know where you're joining the conversation from. And if you feel inclined and you also would like to share your LinkedIn information, we do welcome that into the chat or the comment section, because I'm reminding us all that some folks do join us by LinkedIn Live. And so we welcome you as well. We are paying attention to the comment section there. We're bringing all of that information into the chat room here for those who are live as part of the Zoom community for this podcast. We do have closed caption that's available for those who may need it. That's our way at NWC of really showing forth support for disability inclusion. So we want to make you aware of that in case that could be a benefit. I also want you to know that cameras today, for those of you who are part of our Zoom community, they are encouraged, but they're not required. We certainly love smiling faces, but we know that many of you join us um, just as you're kind of listening in the background, or um, and we are, we're grateful anyway in which you are participating. I would love for you to all be mindful of the chat and the comment section today. That is a way to get proximate to each other, to extend this sense of community as we learn with and from each other. So share your thoughts, your sentiments, and any resources that you feel like this community could gain benefit from. I am happy that each of you are, are with us this week because I know there's been a lot of information in different situations that have occurred across the U.S. that we are holding in mind, and we will address that. But nonetheless, sometimes it's great when we're dealing with those things to be in community, and so I'm so glad you are here. Okay, once again, welcome to Intentional Conversations podcast. So as the screen says, let the conversations begin. And that is exactly what we're going to do momentarily. Once again, I want to just extend a warm welcome to each of you who are joining us today for Intentional Conversations podcast, where we intersect conversations of diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging with leadership and business. We are thrilled that you have decided to spend this hour with us. And we are committed to bringing you really good content and a great experience. I want to shout out the NWC team, who I am so grateful for that works tirelessly every single week as we divide and conquer to bring this virtual learning experience um, as courtesy to the broader community, just so that we all can be in community with each other um, to learn and deepen our understanding of all of these concepts that we care deeply about. I know that because you wouldn't be here if you were not interested in the topics that we share during this hour. One of the things that we like to do at NWC is to always highlight some of the national observances, but I'm always careful to share that while we may highlight it during the month where we are nationally um, encouraged to observe those different um, situations, it's not because we feel like that is the only time that we need to be intentional about that. But we are soon approaching National Hispanic Heritage Month, which starts on the 15th of September. And I want you all to be aware of that. And so make sure that you're finding ways to build up your cultural intelligence, cultural humility, to learn more about the Hispanic um, community. And I'm sure that that group will feel very well supported um, by each of us doing our collective part to do just that. September is also National Recovery Month. And for those of you who may be asking yourself, well, what is that all about? During National Recovery Month, we celebrate the more than 20 million Americans, yes, I said 20 million, who have had the courage to seek help for substance use disorder. And so we want to make sure that we are continuing to um, show forth the need of support for those individuals to keep them encouraged, to make sure that they remain in community and so they can continue to thrive and survive. And so definitely wanna make sure that we place that into your hearing for this month. 
I continue to stress to you that I am a LinkedIn learner instructor and I'm grateful to be one. Uh, my course, which released at the end of June, has reached now over 6,500 learners, and it's all about individual accountability for equity and inclusion. I encourage you all to check that out. Um, my team will place that into the chat and uh, I'll make it free for you for the next 24 hours. And so I hope that you will um, share this with others who think will gain value from being exposed to this content. New courses will be releasing too, in fact, after the first of the year. And so I look forward to sharing more with you about that at a later date. It also does me great pleasure to continue to share my book, Baby, um, Inclusion Uncomplicated, A Transformative Guide to Simplify DEI, released at the end of January of this year in partnership with Forbes Books. If you have it, leave a review. My team will actually place the link to the Amazon page. I love to get those reviews. We're over 100 reviews now. I read them all. I cherish them all. We share them all out where we can. But if you believe in the work that we're doing at NWC and the message that I have, um, certainly um, communicated over and over again as you've joined us for this podcast, then I want you to please share this book out with others so they too can be knowledgeable on ways in which they can strengthen their uh, intentional inclusion leadership. If you know of some folks who would greatly value being a part of this community, but perhaps they can't make this hour each week, you know that they can also catch the replay. We do share those out. We have all of the replays archived on our YouTube channel. My team will place that into the link. But in addition, we also make our vodcasts available in a podcast capacity by extracting the audio. And so if you like to get your content on the go in a podcast capacity, then you have ability to do that. Again, my team will place that link into the chat and our goal of sharing this information so that we can continue to expand this audience of uh, intentional conversations, community members who really are gaining value from being a part of this group. Now, I want to give you a little bit of what you can look forward to now that we're in September. And so next week, we have Dr. Mika Neblet, and we're going to be talking about how a physician workforce that reflects its patient population can be associated with improved outcomes, compliance, cultural humility, and can lead to decreased disparities in the promotion of health equity. And so health inequities are running rampant. And so we need to make sure we are mindful of what's going on and what we can do. So join us on September the 8th for that conversation. And then following on the 15th, we'll be welcoming my friend, Dawn Christian, who's also um, a partner in crime in this great work of belonging and equity and inclusion. And she has a proprietary framework called Ethos Driven Leadership. So she's going to be sharing with us a little bit more about that and the connection between leadership, wellness, and belonging. And so I, I want you all to join us on the 15th for that conversation. Now, if you've been with us, you know that I always like to take a moment to read the full bio of our guest co-host. It's my way of helping you all to understand their accolades, their credentials, their experience, how in which uh, maybe their voice is, is going to be shaped as they talk to us today about their insights. And so I will do the same today for my guest co-host, Daniel Sims. Daniel Sims, EMPS, CNE, and CDE, is an award-winning researcher, author, strategist, and development professional. Deeply stirring and compassionate, he is a subject expert in the continually evolving relationship between philanthropic impact, organizational design, and racial justice. He keenly understands the needs of organizations and communities to create equitable societies. Since 2009, he has designed campaigns and strategic plans that promote justice-led cultures for over 125 organizations, raising over $430 million. Sims holds a BA from the University of Arkansas at Monticello and a Master of Public Service from the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service. Sims has served on numerous local, national, and intentional nonprofit and social impact boards, including the Wingra School Board of Trustees, BOSS, which stands for Building Opportunities for Student Success, and is a member of Forbes the Culture, also known as For the Culture, the Association for Fundraising Professionals, the African American Development Officers Network, and numerous other professional organizations. So at this time, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that Daniel and I can be front and center for this audience. And I just want to extend appreciation for you being here with us today. I never take it lightly when someone says yes to our invite. So I'm so grateful. So thank you so much. And Daniel, before you decide to greet this audience in your own way, one of the things here that we often like to do is to have our guest co-host to share with us something about themselves that we would not know 
from reading their bio, or maybe even from looking at their LinkedIn profile. So welcome, Daniel. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Nika, for having me. It is great to be in community with you today and uh, with everyone who's joining us. I'm really excited about our, our time together. Um, I think something that is uh, really interesting you know, about myself that you certainly wouldn't find in my bio or in a, or on a, a peruse of my LinkedIn profile is my deep love of trivia. Um, so um, 11 years ago, I competed on Jeopardy, which was kind of the, my bucket list item to end all bucket list items. And uh, trivia has always been the way I connect and ground myself in the world, wanting to learn more about the world around me, um, and then being able to, you know, show it off either through competition, um, like Jeopardy, um, international trivia competitions, which is something I do on a regular basis, um, quiz bowl, uh, you name it. Um, that's always been uh, an outlet for me to uh, dispel the energy that one collects doing this work, especially, um, but it also just further, it makes me feel more connected to the things I can't see and I can't touch on a daily basis. And so it, it really drives and informs who I am as a person and certainly informs my work. I so love that, Daniel. I don't know if I've ever had a live conversation with someone, at least not to my knowledge, that has been on Jeopardy. I think that folks who go on Jeopardy are the most brilliant individuals ever. And I, I already thought you were brilliant coming to this conversation, but now I'm even more excited about being in community with you today. And so <laughs> that is a really super neat fact. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, so before we kind of jump in and you know talking about your experiences and the things that are really um, important to you in terms of shaping your your work and how you show up to this space. One of the things we like to do here on the podcast is just bring to the conversation some of what's happening in the in the media for that week and some of the news that has taken place. Um, I am mindful that many of us are continuing to process and to protect our peace and to try to be there for um, other brown and black people that are um, really impacted by what continues to happen, it seems like week after week. And so specifically what I'm referring to in terms of the latest news would be the racially motivated killings that occurred in Jacksonville, Florida at um, a dollar store. And um, I just want to be in community with this group, you know, and hold space for, you know, whatever thoughts and feelings that maybe anyone is um, is dealing with right now. And to maybe through the chat, encourage folks to, to share those thoughts. I don't want anyone to feel like they are alone. Um, I'm often asked as a practitioner in this space, how do you keep going during these times? Well, the truth is sometimes I don't. I haven't even taken to social media to talk specifically about that yet because I'm still processing, but um, I, I just want to give you, Daniel, space and time to share what's coming up for you as, you know, as a as a society, we continue to deal with these things. How have you been processing? I would say I'm, I'm, I'm in a very similar uh, space as you are, where this has become, and, and we know it is so commonplace now, to not find safe harbor or safe space in living and existing and going about our daily lives. Yeah. And with the very specific focus that I put on the creation of safe spaces and applying my work and, and my research, it's it's become very um, taxing mentally and emotionally to think about you know, how can I keep the keep up creating and manufacturing safe spaces when those spaces are increasingly, um, you know, harder and harder to find in the real world outside of a training intervention or a listening session. And so as I you know, talk with you know, my children, uh, you know, I have a, a young uh, son and a, and a 10 year old daughter um, and, and my wife who also works with me in, in this space and works at a school uh, community that's uh, predominantly uh, black and brown. Um, you know, what are we doing to keep one another encouraged? Mm -hmm. Because the, you know, at, at this stage, that's the best I can muster is yeah. you know being being present for myself and for my family and then how do i slowly start to take what i'm gaining and feed it back into the the community beyond myself yeah uh, I think that's where i am yeah no I, I i love that and i love that you have 
um, reached a place to where as a practitioner in this space, um, you know when to um, step away when you need to. Um, I think that's really important. I placed a lot of pressure on myself early on when I felt like these, these issues were occurring that I always had to just immediately be present. And then I finally learned I, I can't pour if I'm an empty cup. I need to take care of self too. I need to take a moment to process. And so um, I love the fact that you and your partner have that in common, that work in common, that you can kind of rely on each other during these moments. And so thank you so much for sharing that. I invite others to share in the chat as well if it's a sense of um, release and community for you to be able just to socialize um, how you are processing. Um, another thing that made its way into the news this week um, is Coco Graff. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, she, she plays tennis and she's amazing and she's I think 19 right now. So she has this incredible talent at such a young age. And um, she recently has received a lot of um, favorable comments all on social media because um, she stood up for herself to the umpire um, in a recent tennis match as her opponent was repeatedly getting a pass on taking too long to get ready for her serves. And um, while she could have waited, you know, like, which a lot of us will do, we'll just kind of, we'll feel the pressure of it, but we won't say anything. She spoke up, she spoke up. And um, I think that so many of us are just um, in admiration of her courage for speaking up and her um, advocacy of self. And um, I just want to bring that to the conversation as well. So your thoughts there, Daniel. Um, so I'm a big Coco fan um, ever oh, since awesome. her... Uh, <laughs> Uh, amazing run at Wimbledon five years ago. I've been Team Coco uh, all the way, and was and was watching the match um, earlier this week um, yep. on Monday night when this happened. And you know, she was absolutely in the right. You yeah. are, you're, you know, that's her workplace. She's yeah. there to do a job, which is to win and perform at a yes. high level, yes. and not being able to do that because someone feels in standing in their privilege, as her opponent was doing, um, that you know slowing the match slow play and things like that having played sports uh, you know, back in in the olden days um you want to be able to get keep the main thing the main thing and, and yes. get to work and she called it out rightfully so and you know and was supported thank, uh, thankfully um by that by the chair umpire but of course after she did that a white woman cried and yeah. so we we had this reaction something that yeah. you know she took personally and felt attacked but you know the facts are the facts and yes, there was yes, slow play absolutely. going on. Why? It doesn't matter why it was happening. It doesn't matter that, you know, you created a situation where a young black woman who's 19 years old and is now a veteran in her sport, a tested tested veteran, yes. had to advocate for herself immediately to be able to have a safe space to do her job. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, well stated. And so, yeah, I think that it's important to acknowledge the white fragility that took place in that situation. Um, and someone placed into the chat that she's she's very self-aware at such a young age. And I definitely agree with that. Um, I'm also mindful that when she played against um, Serena, um, that, you know, she cried, right? Because, you know, she lost the match and, and, and she was, she was, she was really young then she was younger. And a lot of people, their commentary was to, um, address how young and maybe, you know, still green that she is. And so in my mind, I feel like for those that may have had that, um, perception of her, that the fact that she was so bold and courageous to do what she did to self-advocate and, um, yeah, and bring facts to the attention to the umpire, I think was 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 something that hopefully will cause those who um, may have seen her kind of as that young woman that was real fragile and maybe that just, um, um, you know, couldn't take the pressure of being a professional, you know, athlete um, to rethink, you know, maybe those sentiments. But anyway, I'm a big Coco fan as well. And so um, I love that. I love that, you know, you also share that in common with me. Um, and yeah. I think it was funny at, after the match uh, when she was interviewed, you know, she made light of it. Um, when they asked how the match was, she said it was slow. And, you know, everybody, <laughs> that, you know, she was able to take it, move one, move with it and, you know, and keep going. Yeah. You know. I agree. I agree. You know, and so many black women, you know, whenever they're bringing something to the fore with great passion, we, you know, we get labeled as the black angry woman. Right. And so the fact that she was able to bring levity at that time, um, again, I think it just shows her level of maturity, her level of self-awareness. And so, I mean, Anne also plays, thank you, Anne, for being here, but she plays into the chat that it's an example of how the system, in this case, the umpire allowed the ongoing rule breaking before Coco had to speak up. Yes. It's like we turn a blind eye sometimes to, to situations that are um, inequitable and that are unfair 
until someone has to raise their hand and say something. And that shouldn't be the case. And so, Anne, that's a great point that you brought. And then the last thing that I'll mention before we'll jump in kind of to your background and your story is that, and this may be new news for a lot of folks because I just became aware of it this morning. I think the news just broke this morning. But Ross Brewer, um, for those of you who don't know who she is, she um, is the CEO and a board member, member of Walgreens. And she is one of only a handful of um, Black women CEOs. But she announced um, this morning that she is stepping down from that post. And uh, I can't help but to feel some kind of way, you know, about that only because um, I mean, I'm sure that she's she's brilliant. So I'm sure that she certainly was well aware of um, all of the the implications and she was very um, astute in making that decision, but it makes me sad in some ways, strictly because again, we're already very limited. So as a black woman, um, she's someone that I have, have had a lot of admiration for. And so um, anyway, I just, I wanted to bring that to the conversation. Any reactions there, Daniel? Yes, uh, so um, I, I was I happened to uh, read that um, in the Wall Street Journal uh, this morning, and she's had a storied career uh, in business from being yes, CEO of Sam's Club to CEO of Starbucks yeah. before moving to Walgreens. Um, and I think having uh, essentially being a, uh, a scapegoat of sorts for the uh, the, uh, the the turn and fortune of, of Walgreens in the second act of uh, of COVID, um, you know. Now they're in a lot of the articles I've read. They're looking for someone with "quote unquote" more healthcare experience as they've experience, uh, yes. acquired, um, you know, various primary care facility, uh, you know, organizations to now be attached to Walgreens stores because the model is changing. Uh, you know, the retail piece apparently is something they're moving away from, and that being her area of deep experience, you know, that she's being caught up in this in this shift, which is in a lot of ways unfair. We've seen other situations with. Uh, non-black and brown um, CEOs that have overseen, you know, periods of, of large profit losses and, uh, you know, bad decisions in adding product lines and they're rewarded um, for failure. And, and so it, it is just another example of, you know, of, of black um, leaders in the C-suite, you know, continuing to try and innovate across, across a, a myriad of, of challenges, market and otherwise, um, that are, you know, being, uh, made the victim then of you know, circumstances that are a lot of a lot of the time outside of their control yeah yeah you you hit the nail on the head thank you for bringing all of that to the conversation so um i i actually have not read the wall street journal article so i'm definitely going to do that and if the team could find it certainly place it into the chat but how I became aware is that I'm connected to her on LinkedIn and I read her post. And let me just say this, um, I've always admired her, I have. And, and again, you gave her history of, um, of just amazing um, leadership. And um, she never went into detail within her post. It was so gracious, it was so um, directed and I'm sure very calibrated as she was writing it. The only mention was um, when she said, in the near term, I will continue to advise the board as they search for a permanent CEO with healthcare expertise. And I know that that portion of it was incredibly intentional. And um, yeah, so, so much more I could say, but yeah, I wish her well. I know she's going to land in, in something that's going to be amazing because she is just that deserving and 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 capable and qualified. And so anyway, wanted to bring that to the conversation. Okay, so now about you, Daniel. I would love to learn more about your background. Specifically, I want to understand, tell us about your journey and how you ended up in your current role. I mean, the, the disciplines that you intersect, you don't hear about that quite often. So I just want to understand how did you find that niche and and um, let us learn a little bit more about what your journey has been like so far. Absolutely. Um, it, it is not uh, common. Um, certainly, certainly, uh, I'm not the, the only person in my field that, that kind of has this, this worldview, um, particularly in philanthropy as the work around uh, you know, racial equity and philanthropy has continued yes. to grow um, in the academy over the last 20 years, certainly in the last 10, um, with Dr. Tyrone Freeman and others kind of uh, leading a lot of those conversations um, through their work. Um, but I, a lot of it is an intersection of my personal lived experience and my professional experience. So um, I am um, a native Ar a native Arkansan, grew up in, Ar in the Mississippi Delta, uh, Mississippi River Delta region, um, 
a stone's throw from Mississippi um, in a town called Helena or southwest of Memphis. Um, and so growing up, you know, I was surrounded by blackness. My town was 72% black. So everything yeah. I knew was black. Yeah. And that's not the standard, always the standard black Southern experience you hear about when you, yeah. you're talking to people. Oh, I'm from a small town. There were a few of us in that. But, you know, we, it, being from a very poor and disadvantaged area, um, nonprofits and philanthropy um, really drove a lot of my day-to-day -day life whether it was from a food pantry or going to an after-school center or some sort of other you know, programs to help me stay off the streets or have a place to, to go that is uh, you know, helping to enrich me academically or emotionally or socially, um, that really formed my worldview about how philanthropy helps stabilize and advance the common good in, in a civil society. And so I grew up knowing that I wanted to work with nonprofits. I fell into fundraising, as many as many people do, um, yeah. through those experiences. Um, but as I started working um, in 2009, um, with uh, my first job being helping lead a, uh, a blues festival in my hometown, um, we ran into a lot of challenges in bringing people back to the fold. So this was during a time of um, decline for the event. Um, it's one of the... Uh, largest blues festivals in the country and for many years was the second largest free festival in the country before mm. uh, my tenure um, and the team that I worked with and I uh, created a paid system uh, but we ran into issues with a town that's 72 percent black being part of the birthplace of the blues not being able to directly benefit from what that means so uh. being vendors at the festival space being able to um benefit the from the economic uh you know the reap the economic benefits of people coming from between 60 and 70 countries around the world to a small town in Arkansas for a week in October every year uh, for now almost uh, 40 years um to experience blues music and for what many people describe as a spiritual experience and so mm. one of my chief tasks was figuring out how do we connect our residents to opportunities to make money to build their businesses yeah. and to be successful. Because for most businesses that we uh, talked to and worked with during that time, you know, many of them made all the money that they needed to make for the year in that week. And they would open up for that week or two weeks and be done for yeah. the year. Oh, people are coming all over and they want to eat my food or buy my souvenirs and I can make $100,000 and go home. And that's what we wanted, and that's what we yeah. wanted to create. In, in addition to knowing that we had long-term vendors who would travel on that circuit um, in the South, um, many of the state fairs and things happen in the fall because summers are hot, as we've all experienced yes. uh, this year, um, even here in Wisconsin. Um, but you know, our foot, our fairs here are in July and in August. In the South, it's September, October, November, and so you're on that circuit to stop to do that. And we wanted to really be intentional about that. And so we started to uh, really see an increase in interest. People wanted to come and attend. People wanted to volunteer. Um, and that's when I knew that there was some work to do to figure out how does this all come together? And yeah. so you know, now, you know, 14 years later, my work is really centered in, you know, in addition to philanthropy and using philanthropy as a vehicle to advance and address social issues and, and social challenges. From the philanthropic side, it's about how do people use the systems of philanthropy mm -hmm. and increase not only the, the opportunities to address social issues, but as philanthropist, how are we changing who we think of as a philanthropist? Um, yeah. It's not just the, the white, uh, you know, the Waltons or the Rockefellers right. or the Fords or, or the big names that, that we hear about it and know about. Um, and actually, it's those foundations that have that really began to look at that, um, starting in the 2010s, and say, you know, we want to be more intentional about, you know, how we see ourselves as philanthropists, partnering yeah. with organizations. Um, you know, it's not just about being an ATM or giving a giving some money and then going on to the next thing. How do we build partnerships to address these subject areas that we're passionate about funding? and seeing transformed um, as our society continues to evolve in leaps and bounds through the, uh, the mid-2000s, certainly through COVID, and certainly through the, um, 
the newly uh, reinvigorated conversations and reckonings on racial justice um, that we have been navigating um, and continue to navigate. Um, in addition to individual donors, because you can talk about foundations all day long, but with individual yeah. donors, because 70% of all gifts given in America come from individuals and not from foundations, um, how are we looking at non-white donors as philanthropists? Because, for example, Black Americans um, are philanthropic on a uh, level that is much on a much higher proportion than any other racial group. Yes. So our Hispanics yes. and Asians. And so understanding that we are philanthropic and we have been philanthropic for centuries and the ways that make the most sense to our community, our communities and what the needs are, um, bringing them into the fold of organizations uh, that they believe in and treating them as joint partners in the work that we do to cultivate and identify and, and, and close gifts and deepen relationships to advance missions. Uh, so that's kind of the baseline. And then as I continue to work uh, and work with organizations trying to navigate this journey, I realized, all right, they need help in understanding, you know, how DEI or JEDI, as I use, Justice, Equity, yeah. Diversity, and Inclusion, mm -hmm. informs how they see themselves in, in these organizations, how they see themselves in building these relationships and partnerships. Um, but most importantly, as I mentioned, how the systems work. Um, yeah. A lot of DEI training uh, that we see and, and, and initiate and facilitate deals with the, the individual in the workspace and how to create safe spaces at work. But they don't always simultaneously then address the systems and the processes of the work itself. And so that's what I bring to the table. Well, as we are doing training interventions to train individuals on how to change their worldview and mitigate and manage their biases and other things that they're bringing into spaces, we are then tackling the work of the work it and is. trying to find ways to simultaneously bring this change together along this journey so that the trajectory of individuals and the trajectory of the work they then have to do when we leave are as uh, on even step uh, on an even footing as possible. Yeah, Daniel, you you just said a mouthful, and there's so many different points I want to amplify. But thank you for giving us that that context. And um, the first thing that I'll say is this is really resonating with me because um, you said that a lot of you know the majority of the giving are just individual donors. Yes, and so um, for the longest, my husband and I were just individual donors of, of causes that we felt uh, an alignment with, and we eventually decided to form a foundation. And part of the, the reason for, for establishing that foundation, it's Carlo Nica White Foundation, is that um, as Black individuals, we felt that it was important to be able to help um, create greater visibility of um, what philanthropy what philanthropists look like outside of the the perception that most people have and so what you described was is is very much resonating with me the other thing that comes to mind for me is that when i think about a lot of um, foundations a lot of even nonprofit organizations you know most often they exist to serve the needs of the underserved right so they're in the space of addressing um uh, human services, right? And what I have found is that if those organizational leaders aren't careful, they will almost operate with the mindset that because their mission is rooted in human services of underserved communities, that maybe they don't need to be as intentional from an organizational perspective, making sure that how they operate and how they show up and how they make decisions, but also with the broadened lens of how are we doing this work internally as an organization, you know, regardless of what is our our mission and our outcome. And so that's something else that comes to mind. And then I definitely want us to dig deeper into, you know, managing bias and training, because you, you mentioned that it's important at the individual level for people to, um, to really be trained and equipped to understand how to identify where those biases could be creeping in, because those are the folks who are the donors. Those are the folks who are also the leaders in organizations, right? So they're implementing systems, they're shaping culture. And, um, and I know that's something that's really important important to you. So let, let's go to that topic. I know that um, 
you help to support a lot of organizations and even you facilitate a lot of training that is meant to be effective. Right now, unconscious bias training, implicit bias training, it's something that it seems like everybody asks for. Um, and it's being criticized that it's not done effectively. And it seems like you have really found why it's not being done effectively. So I want you just to talk about that and, and help us to understand what things that we should be having in mind as we either hire consultants or trainers or as we engage in these learning experiences. Absolutely. Um, I think that I, I would say for people from that are not, uh, you know, native to our space, uh, of working and understanding DEI training and certainly training design, um, that for a lot of, for the, for the, uh, uninitiated, we'll say, um, that unconscious bias training for many is the crown jewel of what they perceive to be the, you know, DEI training, you know, cadre that they yeah. need to implement in their workplaces, um, more often than not in conventional ways, um, that they feel will move their organization forward or, in reality, just check a box, yes. um, depending on the on the workplace or the organization. Um, you know, at its core, you know, unconscious bias training and and also in implicit bias and others are supposed to reach down into the organization to the individual to raise awareness of what are these shortcuts yeah, and or these mental and emotional shortcuts yes. that lead to the snap judgments that we make that undergird our relationships and our decision-making um, in workplaces in society, and in society at large. Um, but we know that it's not working because we send the message, I think, that biases are involuntary and, and, and that they are widespread and that, you know, um, and, and, and beyond our control. Yeah. Uh, Right. And so as when we develop it that way and then we make them, uh, you know, voluntary uh, for many or they are involuntary. Black and brown people who are more often than not the direct victims or recipients of of unconscious bias are in training spaces where more damage is being done than healing. Yeah. And so what we have done is um, we don't require in most organizations um, that um, you know, black and brown or other affected communities attend the trainings that we put on. And instead, we create separate training or listening spaces where they are able to connect, do work where, they, where, the, where we identify as appropriate alongside their white colleagues who are in the standard training space. And then we mm. intersect those groups at various points in time based on the trajectory of the trainings to put it to the test and, mm. connect and listen to one another. And then we separate again until, mm. we're, until we're moving down the line. Um, a lot of that, um, as I um, we were talking before um, the show, um, comes from um, prejudice habit breaking, uh, which is a, uh, a hallmark um, approach of Dr. Uh, Pat Devine, um, who is a, a professor of psychology here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and this is um, actually one of the only interventions um, based on her research that shows that there is a, a marked long-term change in, in, um, in outcomes when it comes to intergroup bias, increasing awareness and our concern around um, you know, long-term decreases of implicit bias. Um, yes. in workplaces and in um, interpersonal relationships. And so that is kind of the, the North Star that we like to use to ensure that anything that we are doing to move an organization forward um, to the best of our ability um, is leaving minimal damage to the people that we're trying to support. Yeah, that is really good. I don't know if that, if the harm that can be, um, you know, inflicted upon those who are part of those marginalized communities is always something that is thought about when these trainings are being designed and constructed. And so I love the fact that there's been great level of intentionality you and your firm has given to 
to, to incorporating that. Um, and I, I do think that there's great value and um, groups coming together, right? I mean, I think that the safe space um, certainly can help minimize that harm. And that's not, and we want to be sure that we're protecting, right, the needs of the most vulnerable, right, the most marginalized. What I also find, though, is that when there are times in a somewhat controlled environment, brave environment, right, where people feel that they can share stories, those stories really help, I believe, to cause a greater sense of compassion and empathy, right? And I think that is important on the journey towards realizing that whether the intent was there or not, I need to be much more mindful as an individual to not create that harm for someone. I need to pay attention to their needs. And if the harm is created, I need to make sure that I am approaching it in a way of how can I restore and repair this relationship? And so the, the structure of separating them, bringing them back together, and then separating them, bringing them back together um, is really interesting to me. Um, one of the things that I'll share, and I want to get your thoughts on this, you know, we've heard implicit bias, unconscious bias. The reality is that I don't think we talk enough about the conscious bias. And so um, part of how I like to show up to this space and this work is to really talk about it in the affirmative. I much prefer to do a session on conscious inclusion, which in essence is about giving people the strategies, the tools, the language to recognize and to break down um, the, you know, the, the propensity for unconscious bias or bias, whether it's conscious or not, to kind of show forth. Um, and so I'm just, I'm curious about if that's something that you've ever considered as you're kind of developing these sessions. And there's such negative connotation to the unconscious bias. And I don't think that it's fully accurate either, because again, there's a lot of conscious bias out there that we need to correct for as well. I do agree um, with that. Um, I think that all of our work, just from what we've been describing, is really about shifting from a deficit mindset to an abundance mindset. Yes, uh, yes. And, and how we are you know, leading, um, individuals within the organizations we work with to reimagine and, and revision um, how they yeah. fit in, in their using their lived experience and the lived experience within the workplace um, to be able to value and leverage our differences to achieve those affirmative results and that affirmative right. culture. Um, yeah. Right. Um, so I, I do think that it, it certainly uh, informs to uh, to a fairly decent degree, you know, how we train, because all of our trainings are, are curated to the client. Um, mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. There, And so um, I think that's something I'm thinking about more uh, now, um, especially when I look at, you know, my relationship, for example, to the 70-20-10 model for designing. Um, you know, we know yes. that 70% of, you know, right. our, our knowledge comes from job-related experiences, 20% mm. from our interaction with other people, and then 10 from these educational events. So yes. how are we using that 10% to really inform how we want that 70, um, particularly the 70 of the 20% pieces to be transformed and to stay transformed? Yeah, no, I, I thank you for bringing in the 70, 20, 10 to the conversation. You're right, you know, and I think that's also why it's important for us as practitioners who are designing these learning experiences to make sure that we are encouraging those clients to think about more of a, of a learning strategy and a learning path so that it's not kind of this one and done. We need multiples of those and even for people to be through maybe the more formal um, training, also motivated to, to stay on their own personal learning journey um, as much as they can, because part of that work comes at the personal level as well. You account for um, bias as, as it shows up in processes and systems. I mean, we know that it shows up in people, but sometimes I feel like we don't place enough emphasis on how it shows up in systems. Now, granted, it's the people that are often developing these systems, policing these systems, but I think that the bias and process and system sometimes gets left out of the conversation. And let me just pause here for a second, Daniel, before I get you to answer that. I want this audience to know that we're going to be shifting in just a moment to take your questions and your comments. And Tracy, I see that your hand is raised, so you'll be the first person that I will call on. Um, but if you desire to actually unmute yourself and to share, use the raise hand feature that lets me know, and I'll call on you. And if you're joining us by LinkedIn Live and you have questions, place them into the comments, and we will make sure that we pull that over um, so that as time permits, we can address those as well. So Daniel, go right ahead. Absolutely. Um, the thing that I always uh, stress in my trainings and in consulting uh, with organizations is that the systems and the tools that we use are not value neutral. 
as you said, there is someone behind a keyboard and behind a screen um, that is creating the algorithm or creating the uh, the equations and and the systems that we're using. Um, and I, I this is something I talk about a lot in um, my work with uh, nonprofits um, and their fundraising systems. Um, the one big area where we as a profession are still trying to move that needle is in uh, wealth screening and, and donor identification systems. Mm -hmm. um, so we mm -hmm. talked a little bit earlier about, you know, how are we changing who we perceive and view as philanthropist or as a prospect for um, annual giving or major giving or planned gift. And a lot of the research uh, tools that we use, um, whether it's uh, donor search or iWave or other systems like that that are using records, say, like political donations or real estate sales or things like that um, to identify, you know, what is the what is a person's capacity and propensity to give to our organization? Um, a lot of you know pieces are missing um, for years, for example, um, because of various, uh, you know, real estate um, concerns and systems for um, Native American uh, philanthropists, a lot of information about uh, potential Native American donors were not available in mm. donor research systems. And so this was something um, at uh, UW-Madison during my time um, at the UW Foundation, um, which uses an example of ways that we work directly with communities like the Ho-Chunk mm. Nation and Potawatomi Nation um, to figure out how do we um, change um, how we are accessing that information? Where does it live? How do we make sure that it is part of our general body of data that we can use to bring people into the process and into the conversation? Because we don't know, um, just from the outside looking in, who is a donor? Who's a connector? Who are people that can really rally around a particular mission and a cause? Um, and so that is so that is a, a big area of advocacy and work um, that we undertake is understanding where those uh, things are and then bringing those donors and those prospects to the table to talk about how they want to be found mm. and then applying that to the process. Yeah, no, great, fantastic. And so Tracy, as you prepare to unmute yourself, I also see in the chat with the question of wanting you to repeat the professor's name at the University of Wisconsin. I believe that that was Patricia Devine that you mentioned yeah, earlier. Okay, fantastic. So Tracy, share your question or your comment. You're free to unmute yourself at this time. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm enjoying today's topic. Thank you so much for what you've shared. Um, I have a question and a comment. Uh, when you were talking about the person who was at Walgreens that I don't know if she, she resigned apparently, but there was some other things going on behind the scenes. And you mentioned that uh, there was this narrative around her not having healthcare expertise. And I'm so glad that you brought that to the to the fore because I've been hearing that I don't have certain expertise. Um, is when you're very competent in what you do, and they can't dispute your performance and your expertise. There will be those narratives. So in my work, I've been hearing a narrative about not being as familiar with the develop international development sector. Um, and at first, I didn't pick up on it. And then I kept hearing it from different sources. And it was like, it was almost like somebody picked up a talking point and just started running with it. And so um, I don't know what to do about that just yet. I'm still trying to figure that out, navigate it. I'm, I'm open to any advice that you may have, but I just wanted to thank you for raising that to my awareness um, and, and just uh, with affirming, <laughs> validating my suspicions around it. Um, the second thing I would like to ask is with regard to your training, I have a need for gamification because sometimes the trainings and the things, the topics are so heavy that we need to gamify the learning and bring levity. Not that you would wanna minimize or trivialize people's lived experiences, but sometimes in order to learn, you have to, people have to let the guards down. And I find that gamifying that is so much easier. And you mentioned you like trivia. So I was wondering if you brought trivia into your educational tool toolkit and if you could make some recommendations on gamification. Thank you. 
absolutely. Thank you, Tracy, um, for your question um, and your comment. Um, so um, gamifying is a, uh, a strategy that we use. Um, we um, are, I'm a big, as a data-driven person, we use uh, a lot of game dashboards um, as, a, as a feedback loop um, for training so that our, the leaders that we're working with are able to track the trends um, that are emerging and being serviced in, in our discussions, um, but also being able to build on the feedback data. Um, we use that uh, to continue to change the tenor of the training while we're in a live intervention. Um, we use that um, in the systems review and transformation as well um, to address new pieces. And there's a model, um, I would say I don't think I sent it over, but we use a, a model um, that it's fairly cyclical that talks about how the continual servicing of beliefs and uh, and uh, opportunities for growth that we find through our specific cadences um, helps with that and actually is really good for, for gamifying through trivia, through um, through other mechanisms that we continue to try and uh, create and, and innovate um, as we're working with various clients. So um, I do agree that it is uh, something now that is becoming uh, much more necessary. Um, so through immersive scenarios, um, we do team-based challenges. Um, we are starting to explore what video and audio activities um, look like for us. And then starting to combine that as we are working on more on a technical side with how does that look? Is it badges? Are there leaderboards? So there are there are a number uh, of, of options that we use and that we recommend uh, to clients that uh, want to um, incorporate that not only in our live training, but in our long-term training after we have uh, you know, ended the relationship. Yeah, I love, um, Daniel, that what you are, how you show up to the, the, the training and the learning experiences certainly takes into account the power of being creative and innovative and reaching diverse learners as well, because, you know, no one's going to enter one of those sessions. Everyone's not going to enter those sessions at the same place within their learning journey around this broad topic. And so we have to make sure that we are appealing um, to all the different senses and trying different ways to, to make that immersive experience really um, impactful for as many people as possible. And I share that because I think that that is even more important when we consider um, the state we're currently in and the political climate around this body of work. We have to be more strategic. We have to be more creative uh, because the work needs to continue even in spite of some of the challenges and navigating how to actually execute and do the work. And so thank you for the question, Tracy, around gamification. And thank you, Daniel, for um, sharing a bit more in that regard. So we're, we're running up against time, but I also want to talk about um, you know, the, how can a trainer, how can a DEI trainer really effectively assess their performance, their delivery, their effectiveness? And so talk a little bit about how in which you go about that. So this is a fairly uh, evolving uh, <laughs> topic for us. Um, for um, a, for many years, um, we would provide, um, point in, and we still do, um, point in time surveys for yep. um, um, attendees. Um, mm -hmm. asking, you know, specific questions about the training for a particular day or a particular week. Um, and two questions that we um, always um, include are, um, A, um, in what way did the presence of the trainer increase your knowledge in this way? And in what ways do you want your trainer to show up differently to help advance mm -hmm. your journey? And yeah. providing that opportunity for narrative um, has, has really proven to uh, give us not only a wide array of, uh, of data and, and opportunities to say, all right, today we were present by really pressing on um, the, the an immersive scenario um, around um, you know, pay equity um, or, or promotions. Um, and that created an uncomfortable situation for this HR manager or, or this other attendee. Uh, or we really dug deep into um, environmental uh, microaggressions and how those are affecting morale in this particular team or this particular unit. And we needed to have a bit more compassion or a bit more concrete examples shared in this topic or that topic. And so we then use that based on the, the training that we've designed to say, you know, our goals for our, so we have a goals for the training and then we write subsequent goals for the facilitator. So your goal for this is to carry people to this spot 
to illuminate this topic. And when that doesn't happen, then we have a, a series of surveys that, that we use internally um, as listening sessions or with one-on-ones or um, a full or a full team um, to then figure out how we adjust to meet those moments or figure out if those moments are even still relevant to that team based on the, uh, the, the data that they share with us. Yes, I Daniel, I am picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> the intentionality behind your approach is 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 amazing. And I think that that is exactly what separates effective training from training that um, people begrudgingly show up to when the organization says this is mandatory, you have to come. And so it makes a big difference. I often say I want people to do this work because of not in spite of right, you don't want them kicking and screaming during the work because that just breeds resentment. And so I love the two questions. I want you to make sure that I have them clear for so we can place them into the chat for this community. But the first one was, in what way did the presence of the trainer, can you repeat that one again? And actually, the second so one, in as what well. way did the um, presence of the trainer increase your knowledge in area mm. B. Um, and then second is, you know, in what ways should, or I guess to paraphrase now, in what ways, um, other ways could the trainer have shown up to help you in that space? So we're yeah. asking it in an affirmative way as we were talking about earlier, um, so that it's not, uh, it's not putting the trainer in a negative light, and it's also right. um, validating the experience of the attendee. Yeah. Yeah. Um think that we only have five minutes left because there's so much more that I want to go go into on that. But the messenger, the facilitator who's delivering the information, it's so important. Even what their experiences are based upon the topic and the content, you need to connect those dots as well. And I also believe that when organizations um, implement some type of learning path, while one could say that there's a lot of value in the continuity of that facilitator, I also think that there is value in being strategic about how do we now think about all of these learning experiences and not necessarily feel um, you know, tied to having to have the same facilitator deliver every single one of those. I think that there's a lot of, again, intentionality that needs to, that goes into those decisions. Um, I also appreciate that part of your approach is not only we're going to identify what are the learning objectives or the goals for you know the training. We we talk about it as learning experiences at NWC, but also what are the goals for the facilitator? That is that is really big, and um, I can see how um, that could make a tremendous difference. Um, what about behavioral outcomes? Something that we've started doing that we feel like. Um, helps to um even further i think seed the 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 outcomes of the of the, the the learning experience it's not only focused on what are the learning objectives but also based upon these learning objectives being accomplished what are the behavioral outcomes that should be in practice as a result of people um understanding and applying that information so is that something also that you incorporate behavioral outcomes Absolutely. Um, so one way that we think about it, and this is uh, something that's uh, echoed by uh, Mary Frances Winters um, in her Mary book, Racial Frances, Justice yes. at Work, yeah. um, is that, you know, there is a trajectory that our training should um, should reach that address each of those things. And so that really starts with self-understanding so that you can yeah. clearly identify what those outcomes should look like. And then you're moving to other understanding, bridging across differences, and then what's most important to me um, on the other side of the work that we do, interrogating the systems. And so that yeah. is where you can really um, apply a litmus test on how your behavioral outcomes are actually going to be manifested and lived out in the change systems that we introduce in the trainings, um, which is, which is uh, I think, unique, uh, somewhat unique to us. And I'm sure that other, um, other teams do that as well. But because we're doing that simultaneous system transformation and policy review, um, we're also looking at, you know, how do we then test this in, in our sessions? So if our behavioral outcome is, say, um, a, a decrease in, um, increase in performance reviews around a particular area, um, right. a, um, um, say, employee retention and engagement in, in certain spaces, um, a decrease in, um, infractions and complaints with a specific right. area surface in the training, um, we could then, with our gamifying, use the immersive scenarios to stress test those. And that's where, using our model, we, we use that as a fork in the road moment. This is how this played out in two or three different ways. Do we really think that we're ready to proceed with this with any degree of certainty 
or integrity, or do we walk it back and start to reconstruct where we go? And so it does provide us then with a number of options to ensure that our final or final um, products about how we're going to hold ourselves accountable are have the highest likelihood of success or success in testing within the, in any case. Love it. Yeah, you referenced uh, Mary Frances Winters, and she's definitely a friend of this podcast. She's been on before, and we are we are connected. She does incredible work, and so um, certainly encourage each of you to check her out. We've also placed all of your contact information, your LinkedIn, um, into the chat because I believe that you are um, you're sharing some really insightful information. I, I'm sure that this community is going to want to connect with you. Um, the last thing that I'll mention before I turn it back over to you to close this out in whatever way that feels appropriate. Daniel, is the, the importance of um, being intentional about the shared accountability um, to help co-create the learning experience. I believe in that deeply. I think that there's a responsibility on the learner's part, and I think that also our responsibility as, as, as practitioners and as facilitators and instructional designers of these learning experiences is that we have to make sure that we are considering that. Um, and so anyway, I just wanted to put that into the hearing of this community. Daniel, it has been such a pleasure. I, I anticipate that we would love to invite you back maybe down the road because there's much more I want to engage with you on. But I want to give you a chance to close this out in whatever way that feels appropriate to you. If there's something I did not ask you about that you're feeling a lot of, um, you know, just feeling emboldening around and you want to talk about it, I want to give you that chance to, to do so. Absolutely. Well, first, thank you for having me. This has been a uh, fantastic conversation. I definitely would love to come back. Um, and say, <laughs> go at me. Um, you know, one thing that um, you know, we're going to talk about is, uh, you know, and we uh, mentioned in some of our prep, um, is that, you know, all of this work and how we have been able to, um, I won't say perfect, but certainly innovate um, at yeah. a high level. Um, we are um, launching a master class um, for nonprofit leaders um, around how to apply this work to their systems, uh, particularly their fundraising systems, but also their donor relationships. Um, something that we uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about is that as you're applying these systems, there is a you know there are several come to Jesus slash rubber hit the road moments um, with our stakeholders and how these changes and systems and changes and in individuals is going to affect our relationship with our current stakeholders within organizations. Yeah. And so providing uh, best practices and tools for organizations to use that are prepared to go on this journey for implementation, but also for um, confrontation and interrogation of those systems, as we yes. mentioned, is really important. And so um, we're looking to uh, um, build out a cohort of you know between 10 and 12 nonprofit leaders to work with us for um, six months starting um, in January. And so um, if you um, contact us um, on our LinkedIn page, um, we'll be happy to provide you with some more information about that um, with the hope of providing a similar um, track for um, for-profit leaders um, later on in 2024. Love it. This was so insightful. So again, your, your contact information in terms of your LinkedIn is into the chat. And so masterclass starting at the front top of the year, you heard it only 10 to 12. So make sure you're staying really connected to that news and um, happy Labor Day. Have a safe weekend, everyone. And if this has been of value to you, I do encourage you to share it out with someone else in your community that you think would also gain um, benefit from it. And if you are willing to share some of the takeaways or maybe some of the ways in which this community um, in this Intentional Conversations podcast is, is helping you and benefiting you. would love for you to click on the link that's been placed into the chat and take a quick, quick survey, just a couple quick questions. Um, it just helps us to know, again, if we're bringing value um, at the level in which we intend to to the broader community. Daniel, really appreciate you. Thank you all so very much. Have a great weekend. Thank you.